Hit record. And clap on three. One, two. Hello, and welcome to Unsolicited, the podcast that gives fictional characters advice they did not ask for. I'm Emily Blake. Happy New Year, folks. As you know, Owen and I are both invested in the school system. I'm a teacher, and Owen started grad school this fall. Over the course of our winter breaks, we've been thinking a ton about self-care and the ways that we care for others, so we wanted to start the year with an episode about the Shel Silverstein classic, The Giving Tree. Owen, tell us what happens in the book. Here's your regular spoiler alert. Yeah. It's a pretty short story, and I remember as a kid thinking that it was really cute. What a beautiful relationship between this tree and this boy. What do you think we're supposed to get out of this book? Like, what do you think the intended moral of the story is, Owen? I think that that's what I get out of it now, but I'm not sure that was the point of the story when it was written. Um, I honestly kind of think that it was intended to be about, gosh, what a cute relationship and how nice that we can come back and continue to depend upon the people on on whom we've always depended. Um, How great is it that nature continues to provide for us and, and we're able to use the whole buffalo, so to speak, you know? Um, and gosh, now I, I find it really troubling. I, I remember this being one of the stories that we read in elementary school, and, you know, I, I think it's a really common read aloud, and it definitely is intended for an audience of children. And I, I think the real moral is maybe very difficult to grasp if you're a child. Yeah, well, and now that I'm reading this as an adult, I wonder almost whether it was intended for an adult audience. I think I think children's books often are really poignant, and we, you know, we give them to adults as gifts at important moments. Um, one of the really common graduation gifts that I see is, oh, the places you'll go, and things like that, that are definitely children's books intended supposedly for children. But who do you, if you had to guess, and we are ascribing an intent to a real person here, but if you had to guess, do you think this book was intended for children or intended for adults?
Totally. So let's talk a little bit about what elements we see in the story now, looking at it as adults. We definitely have touched on the idea of toxic relationships, those non-reciprocal relationships where one person is giving far more than they have to offer, really. When we start to give of our actual self rather than of our resources, we're, we're given too much, right? Yeah, I mean, this, this tree allows herself to be cut entirely to the ground for, for someone else. And that someone else, in this case, is not doing any care for the tree. Um, the boy's not coming back and watering it and making sure that it's fertilized. The boy's not coming back and watering it and making sure that it's fertilized. The boy's just coming back to ask for more, and that's really troubling. Uh, good question. I th think... Well, it's, it's hard to reflect on that honestly. Because... It's hard to reflect on that honestly. Because I think a key element of this relationship is that the tree doesn't see that she's giving too much. Right? And I... I think the tree has plenty of time to reflect on it, but one pain point of the story is that as the boy leaves, the tree continues to be sorry and continues to be lonely. And at the end says, I'm sorry, but I don't have anything left to give you. And ultimately, that that is really troubling, right? Um, I think it makes it difficult also to give a fair analysis of who those people might be in our own lives. Because the kind of the point is that you can't see that you're giving too much, right? Can you identify any in yours? Sure. Owen, oh, can you think of any people in your life that that maybe you've given too much of yourself to or um, supported beyond what was reasonable for your relationship? Hmm.
Definitely. Right? Mm -hmm. By the same token, when I hear from someone who I haven't heard from in a long time, I'm usually excited about it, right? And I, I don't think we want to suggest that if our friends disappear for a long time or are busy managing their own lives, we're not suggesting that that should be the end of a friendship, right? Yeah, that ebb and flow is really important, but it should go in both directions. So what do you think are sort of some red flags for whether a relationship might be entering this particular kind of toxicity, the giving tree kind of toxicity? Mm. Yeah, totally. Um, I think that resentment piece, how you walk away from your interactions, is really key. Um, I think the story shows a lot of sorrow and grief and... Yeah, if, if you're coming out of more interactions feeling icky than you are feeling good, it might be time to start thinking about distancing yourself from that person, or at least saying no sometimes when they ask for things. I also think I have had the, the experience of cutting a few people out of my life. It's, it hasn't been common, for which I'm grateful, um, but I've, I've definitely had a couple of people who I gave more of myself to than I was comfortable giving um, in the form of repeated opportunities when, when I saw that they were making truly selfish and often overtly cruel decisions. Um, and those are the kinds of people that I've just kind of gone, you know, I'm not going to take great pains to, to let them know they're cut out or anything. But boy, I'm never going to be the person who starts the conversation again. And and I haven't in those circumstances. So I, I might run into them through common friends or in professional settings or what have you. But, but, but I don't really do that kind of stuff. And I think in each of those situations, I waited too long to make that decision. Because we experienced a series of boiling points before I made the decision to just end initiation essentially and typically I am not a person who gets angry or frustrated at other people super easily um or maybe I am I suppose you're a better judge of that than I am but it I've had I've been fortunate not not to have that experience with very many people at least so when I am starting to go man this person is really making me mad that usually is a sign that something is actually wrong. And if they're not receptive to a conversation about it, or if you're uncomfortable opening a conversation about it, it might be a sign that the relationship is not worth continuing. Well, and there's something important to be said there too about the idea that confrontation is really uncomfortable for like almost all of us it's not if if you are a person who loves confrontation congrats to you you're gonna have a really good time in a lot of modern america but 
Um, most of us, when we start thinking about upsetting people who we care about or who we ostensibly care about, most of us aren't excited about it. And that's not the same thing that I'm talking about. Um, if you, if you're just going, boy, I'm uncomfortable having this conversation. That's very different from going, having this conversation will ruin things. And those are two really different experiences, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you're in any relationships that you think might bring you physical harm for representing... If you're in any relationships that you think might bring you physical harm for representing the truth or your perception in kind and in kind and intentional ways, you, sh you should probably be looking to get out of that relationship. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, I think there's another dynamic worth discussing here. You mentioned in your synopsis that throughout the story, the, the giving tree is given female pronouns. Do you think that's an important element of the story? Yeah. Well, and girls aren't just taught to be nurturers. They're often sort of taught that martyrdom is the only thing that gives them value. I hear this all the time in people our age when women who are moms start talking about going shopping and they'll say, well, I got this for my kid and this for my kid and this for my kid. And I, I also got this for me and I know that I shouldn't have, but you know, I, and even those small sacrifices, if, if you are someone who has means and wants something, it's okay to give yourself that thing. I, I work a full-time job, and while I'm not someone who spends frivolously, I'm not going to feel badly about spending money on things that I care about or on people that I care about. And I don't feel like I need to spend on, on the people around me before myself. I have a wonderful, wonderful partner, and he does not need me to buy him gifts instead of buying myself the things that I want, right? Um, it's, if I am excited about giving a gift, fantastic. And obviously there is, in the example I gave, a, a very important burden of care. So I'm also not suggesting that, that women, or, or men for that matter, should neglect their children for their own wants. That's not what I'm saying at all. But if you have extra, you shouldn't feel like you have to excuse investing in yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. And while that doesn't seem like it should be gendered, it often is, right? Our society celebrates a lot of the things that are considered victories for men a lot more readily than it, ex than it celebrates things that are victories for women. So, for instance, think about the kind of glory that sports teams receive. And it's really interesting because even the fandoms of those sports teams uh, share those victories. And while there definitely are lots of women who are invested in sports, that is a primarily male pursuit. Similarly, I'll... yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
men are given promotions a lot more readily than women are for a variety of of reasons it would take another entire podcast episode at least to get into into the wage gap um but we celebrate the receipt of a new title or of a raise or you know a, a lot of things that come more easily to men than than we do to women and the kind of things that women often celebrate are things like i lost five pounds right things that shrink women or make them smaller right um and why are we, don't get me wrong, I love celebrating an engagement or celebrating a, a wedding, but why are the things that we judge women on so often based on relationships and whether they have one or not, rather than based on their own expertise and experiences and the things <laughs> that they're choosing to do and the things that they're choosing to do? Yeah, thanks, Shel Silverstein. If you just said he, we wouldn't have gotten to have that conversation. And boy, do I like riffing on on women's inequities. I do too, and I, I think it's even very possible that this woman, the woman the giving tree was intended to represent was the boy's mom. Yeah, you know, we just had this conversation with my mom today. We are belatedly celebrating Christmas in my family today. And um, my brother and I do all our gifts to our parents as shared gifts so that it never becomes a, a comparative situation. And we got my mom some bigger things this year. It's not really competition. Uh, Tristan's best friend is an easy winner in that competition. So, like, that's out the door. Why Why would we even bother? Um, that's, I mean, that's our ongoing family joke. We we talk all the time about how my brother's best friend is, is the favorite son. Our parents would never actually say that, but he is very cool, and I would understand if it was true. So, anyway, so we, we decided a few years back, like, man I always feel bad when I look at what you gave or when you look at what I gave and you know we we want to make sure that things feel good and that everyone gets to walk out of this feeling good so anyway we gave my mom some some bigger gifts this year and she had a kind of a hard time receiving them and and said oh gosh I now I feel like I didn't give you guys enough and and we just kind of went Mom, we are all adults with jobs. You're retired and we're full grown. And at this stage, we buy the things that we want and you don't need to give us a ton of stuff. But we also know that the things we gave you are not things you would buy yourself and they are things that you do or will enjoy. So let it go. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is so painful to come up to some of these gift-giving holidays and you have kind of a long list of people in your mind of who you really should give gifts to and who you have something, a great idea for and and then the people that you know you have to get something, but God, what do I get them? And that that just kind of icky feeling of god what do i get them is something i really really hate and i i fall into that trap sometimes still there are some people in my life that i know i need to get something or they'll be hurt 
But for the most part, I've really tried to set up relationships with my friends so that I can tell them, as I did you this year, you know, I I want to let you know I really appreciate you and I love you a lot. And I just didn't find a gift that screamed your name this year. Um, and in your case, I, I think I actually said, I found a gift that's perfect for your partner, <laughs> but I wanted to let you know I wasn't forgetting you. I just didn't find the right thing. And someday it'll pop up and I'll get it for you then. And you were great about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad that things are that way. I really love her. <laughs> She's great. Okay. Um, back on track though. Yeah, no, let's do a shout out to her because she's rad. Go. She really is. You two are such a good fit. Okay, so uh, we've gotten through a lot of our, our important talking points here. But one of the big questions I wanted to be sure we discussed in this episode is how we intend to genuinely care for ourselves this year. Have you thought through that at all? What are you looking forward to in the new year? That's a balance I've really struggled with also, and I feel like it's one of my priorities every year, so I dream that this year I might figure it out. Um, that work-life balance thing, I, I think, is at the forefront of a lot of adults' minds. And if anyone has any tips, please write in to us. You can reach us at unsolicitedhosts at gmail.com, and we would love some tips about how to how to get our acts together. <laughs> you know, talking about that gender disparity, I think that's something girls are taught to do better than guys. Um, and I might take this back as we, as we think through it. It's not true, certainly in all facets of our lives. But in terms of relationships, like, girls are taught to turn down dates, right? Like, that is really basic. Um, by the same token, girls end up doing a lot of what what is termed unpromotable work, which is stuff around the office or in in whatever your role might be that is helpful and is necessary, but is not something that you can really put on a resume. So for instance, in almost every meeting, a girl ends up being the note taker and no one has ever been promoted because they took great notes, you know? Um, so I, I think it's one of those balances and a lot of what, what, you and I struggle with is balancing our friendships and the time commitments of of what people we care about want from us um, and that I think is where girls excel at no versus balancing work commitments and I think that's where guys excel at no like no I'm not taking on this extra project unless it also comes with extra pay versus girls are like well I want to be seen as a team player so I'm I I will do that extra thing, yes. My plate is already full, but I'll stay an extra hour tonight, you know? No, I... Sure. Yeah, I, I have a lot on my plate right now. I work a sort of more than full-time job uh, teaching band and choir. There are a lot of events outside of the school day, so just just the teaching and prep work part. 
is very full time, but then we also have a lot of concerts and we're, we're at a lot of games and parades and festivals and, you know, all these kinds of things, um, which is an absolute blast. Like, I love it, but it's a lot of hours. My partner does the same job in a different district fairly far away, so it gets really difficult to balance our personal lives with that uh, because we're rarely available at the same time. And on top of that, we got engaged a couple of months ago, so we're starting to figure out how to plan a wedding. Um, yeah. Hey, thank you. Um, thanks. I love being celebrated for my relationships. <laughs> um, but but in all seriousness, thank you. <laughs> no, that's that's really sweet. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're we're really excited. But I think my biggest challenge is to figure out how to manage all of this stuff without treating the people around me badly or getting short tempered. Um, so I, I think I'm going to do a lot of self reflection about how I respond um, to a lot of outside influences. And I think I'm going to keep saying a lot of no's. Yeah, the year of no. I love it. But I'm also glad you said yes to this podcast. So, Owen, what advice do you have for the giving tree? Yeah, put on your own oxygen mask before assisting others. Mm-hmm. Oh, I got to tell you a story. You ready? When I was a teenager, I went to a self-defense seminar with an outstanding teacher, uh, a local guy who trained SWAT teams all across the country and was, was doing a class for mostly female teachers about how to defend themselves. And most of the, most of the participants were a generation above me. My mom was, was with me also. Um, and he asked at one point, hey, if someone came into the room and attacked you, would you fight back? And a lot of them were like, oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I would try, I guess. But but gosh, that sounds terrifying. And I really, I don't know how much I'd struggle. And then he said, if your daughter was being attacked by someone, would you try to fight them? And all of them were like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I, and a lot of them started like tearing up and crying. And he went, you are you are as important as your children. You are as important as the people that you would defend. And I need you to believe that. And I need you to be willing to defend yourselves. Um, and that was a really cool thing that I, I think about a lot now. Mm -mm. Nope. Yeah. I would advise the giving tree to say no, to say all kinds of no's, say no to hanging out, say selfish no's, say non-promotable -pro work no's, say all kinds of no's, say no to anything that you don't want to do, say no to anything that you don't have to do, say no to everything that you can, unless it's a real yes. Like if the inside of you is going, heck yeah, awesome, say yes to that. And otherwise say no to everything. Protect your time, protect your investments, protect yourself. And yeah, and this, honestly, this boy is kind of trash. Yes. Yeah, so important. No means no. And all no's mean no. You know, one of the things that I, I see among friends, especially all the time, that is not not a high stakes issue, but is 
the idea that when people say no, often we try to tease and cajole them into changing their mind. And while there might be moments for that in our lives, I challenge our listeners to think about the most recent time they've seen something like that happen, and whether it was really a net benefit. Yeah. Um... Mm-hmm. Yeah, like none of us need to be in places that we don't want to be. And equally importantly, we don't need to be with people who don't want to be there. So if someone's saying no, assume they mean it and move on. Incidentally, when I was in college, I, I didn't drink at all until I turned 21. And you were there, so you know that. Um, a lot of the people who have... Yeah. Um, a lot of the, the people who have ma remained in my life are the kinds of people who, instead of going, ooh, this person is a challenge and I'm going to convince her to drink, um, heard that I didn't drink and went, okay, can I get you a water? <laughs> you know? Those kinds of people who kept inviting me to, to be a part of their lives, even though I wasn't doing one of the big college activities of getting hammered and, and wanted to spend time with me anyway. Those are, are people I really care about and who I respect because I think that takes a really high degree of integrity at a relatively young age. All right. Yeah, I did not expect to get quite so impassioned, but here we are. All right, you ready? Happy New Year, everyone. Unsolicited is a Salty Pup production. Audio engineering by Robbie Rutherford. Music by Tristan Hurd. Publicity by Allison Biggie. And art by Erica Peterson. I gotta say all of that again, because my dog won't stop barking. Unsolicited is a Salty Pup production. Audio engineering by Robbie Rutherford, music by Tristan Hurd, publicity by Allison Biggie, and art by Erica Peterson. Thanks also to my co-host, Owen Evans. My name is Emily Blake. Thanks for listening. Please rate and review.